But no amount of confidence in Australia's youthful new captain could prepare him for their upcoming tour. We went into Vietnam at the height of the, of the war. Uh, uh, it was just before the big Tet Offensive where the Viet Cong pushed into Saigon in, I think, in the January or February of 68. And we were, we were there in the October of 67. And you can imagine training on the roof of your hotel and there's gunshots going off in the back street. There's helicopters dropping flares all around the city. The United States, Fearing the rise of communist North Vietnam, had conceived a propaganda exercise, along with the puppet regime of South Vietnam, in the guise of an international football tournament called the Friendly Nations Cup. It was intended to highlight the unity of the allied nations of the region against North Vietnam. The conditions that we trained under and played under would never, ever happen again. You know, the hotel was atrocious. The food was, you couldn't eat the food. You know, the food was just diabolical. The water, of course, was, you know, not drinkable. It was always, mate, oh, we'll, we'll send the soccer. If we lose a few of the Sheila's Wogs and Poofters, it won't matter, you know, that sort of attitude. And it was a fabulous experience, and that's where we were born. That was the basis of the team, which eventually qualified for Germany seven years later. No Australian team would, would ever put up with those conditions, without any doubt, now. And there was no alternative. But against that, that also bonded the team. They, they had to be very, very good, uh, get on well with each other and help each other, and they did. And that as, as a, as something that has happened to Australian teams ever since. Johnny Warren's young team was bonding at the right time with the 1970 World Cup looming on the horizon. Their penultimate qualifying match was against Rhodesia, now known as Zimbabwe, in neutral Mozambique. But they would have faced unexpected difficulties from the unfancied Africans. One of their black fellows was the goalkeeper and he kept stopping us from winning. Every time the ball came, he'd fall over or it had happened to hit him or he'd go that way and it hit his feet. And uh, after two games, we were still nil all. We still hadn't won. The desperate Australians resorted to local tactics and called in a witch doctor. I thought he'd be all dressed up like a witch doctor in the movies. But he was an elegant dresser. He was be beautifully suited. And he said, he started off, good morning, sir. So, oh, yeah. And uh, I, before I said anything, he said, I know your problem, sir, and I can fix it. I get this bag of bones, sir, and I bury them down here behind this goalpost, and they will be pointed at the goalkeeper's heart. We raced back to the hotel, went up to the Rhodesia and said, you guess where we've been? <laughs> We'd just been up to see them with you, yeah. And, and uh, I don't know if it worked or not, but we won easily the next game. I thought we'd never see him again. And he's suddenly standing there. He said, uh, who pays the money? He said, I can put a hex on that plane. Now, you can believe this story or not, I don't care. But we got into the plane, and the fellas are still, still grey about all this, and they have just taken up and out of the clear sky, there's a flash of thunder and lightning. And the fellow said, go back and pay him. <laughs> Most of his teammates laughed off the witch doctor's curse. But a superstitious Johnny Warren was convinced the curse lived on in Australian football. From that moment that he put the curse on, everything went wrong for the team. We took 38 hours to get to Tel Aviv. That's the witch doctor. We played 21 hours later without three of our best players who all were suddenly sick. That's the witch doctor. So every time you see those things, you think, ah, this is the... Is the curse is still there. After finally overcoming Rhodesia at the end of a gruelling world tour, Australia's last obstacle to qualify for the 1970 World Cup was Israel. Johnny's team unluckily lost the first leg 1-0 in Tel Aviv before returning to Sydney for the all-important second leg. Captain Johnny Warren, how many goals will Australia need to win on Sunday week? I don't know, one may be enough. <laughs> Uh, I think Israel uh, naturally will come with the idea of uh, getting away with a draw if they can. 
Um, and uh, from what we saw of their defence, they're a very good tactically you know, defensive team and uh, you know we, we will have our work cut out um, beating them. Narrow 1-0 defeat in Tel Aviv and the scene is set for the fateful return game in Sydney. I think we were physically and mentally exhausted by the time we got to Sydney. You know, the, the boys put every effort that they possibly could into that, but we always knew it was going to be a hard encounter. Israel were a great team. And George Keith heading in, uh, Spiegler. And that's the deal. We lost the goal in the halfway through the second half, and uh, guys were a little bit despondent. That's where John's forte as a, as a captain, you know, John always led by example. Australia mounting another attack now through Johnny Warren, number 10, coming up to the Israeli penalty box. But again, that Israeli defence just too strong. Again, Warren on the left, a tremendous shot, and Visaga brought into action yet again. So we fought back, and, uh, and I equalised uh, about five minutes from the end. And Bart's got a boot to it. The watch gets a goal. Johnny Watkins won all, but they need another one. We had five minutes to, to try to try to win the game, but um, you know it wasn't to be. That's the finish. The game's all over. The whistle is gone. A disappointed side faces the fact that today Australia is not the world's greatest soccer nation. Defeat at the last hurdle was hard to bear, and emphasised to Johnny the scale of his football mission. It's very hard to compete uh, in a sport that uh, 145 countries enter into a competition and in uh, most of these sports soccer is uh, in most of these countries soccer is a national sport uh, so that if we are to compete and compete su uh, successfully we have to we have to put a lot more time a lot more effort and a lot more preparation into such competitions what about the raw material i speak now of the broad base of soccer these many thousands of juniors we have yes we have but we must uh, develop them into uh, top class players. Uh, we need a lot of uh, coaches, we need a lot of international experience. This applies to uh, all sports in Australia, but particularly soccer. At 27, Johnny was at the peak of his powers when an innocuous tackle tore the cruciate ligament in his knee. It was a serious injury from which no sportsman had ever recovered. The injury was devastating for him and uh, just took part of his life and uh, things never ever became the same, even if he was so pleased with his progress. But things, he knew that the things never will be the same. Johnny became very much introverted and concerned. <laughs> Johnny's enforced absence from the game led to other distractions. He began seeing a dancer he met in a nightclub. John was uh, very charismatic back in those days. And uh, I was very young, 17, and he was 12 years older than me. He was very conservative and I was very bright and bubbly. And I think the two probably um, fed off each other. I fell pregnant when I was 19. It wasn't a planned pregnancy, and uh, even though we were very, very much in love, I suddenly realised, after I'd told John, um, that his idea of our future together was, was quite different to mine. I had presumed that he would be over the moon, and uh, I don't think having that settled down family thing was really in his plans. Once I had made that decision that, well, bugger you, I'm going to do this anyway, his attitude totally changed and he supported me. The night Shannon was born was, I'm sure, to John, to the day he died, the best moment of his life. She was just so loved, really so loved. It was weird being brought up in all that. It was a fairy tale. Even right up to when he died, it was a fairy tale because it was just, that's the only way I knew my father was through the, through the meet, the public eye, but I also knew him on the other side as, you know, him ringing me on 
all the time. Like he would ring me twice, twice a week, once a week, depending on how busy his schedule was. And whether it would be a two second phone call or a five, five minute phone call, he'd always ring me. And it was a distant relationship in that aspect in the way that he, was he wasn't always around physically, but he was always there to, you know, if I ever needed anything, he, I could give him a call or stuff like that. Family, like most things, came second to the single-minded Johnny Warren as he trained relentlessly to be the first ever player to make a comeback from a cruciate ligament injury. But in his absence, coach Rally Razic made English-born defender Peter Wilson captain of the national team. Look, uh, being Johnny, being such a huge and popular figure, not only in New South Wales, but South Australia, Victoria, all over Australia. Uh, good links with the world for him was absolute, like taking a baby from the mother uh, when you take captaincy. But it wasn't a matter of that. I didn't think that Johnny will, my view was that Johnny will not make come back to the national team. In retrospect, I think it was a big blow that Johnny wasn't reinstated because if you imagine all the years that he wasn't captain, um, when somebody else was captain, uh, he could have been up there preaching the, the beauties of the game, uh, and he wasn't. And I think that, uh, that uh, Rally Resic should have been aware of that at the time. Maybe he was, and maybe the mission was not his concern. He was there to coach the national team and to win football matches. I remember John being picked for the team for the World Cup in 74, and it was like a sheer relief that, yes, he was going to be part of it, but he fully expected to be captain of the team. It was almost a shock to him that Peter Wilson was, was going to be number one boy and he was uh, absolutely furious with Rally Rasik for so long, for years. Australia's final qualifying match for the 1974 World Cup was against South Korea. After a draw home and away, it was a third and deciding game in Hong Kong. <laughs> 